In the beginning, part 13, the natural limits of neo-Darwinian evolution. We've been going through the book in the beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. It's uh, edited by Brian Ball, who uh, was born in England, got an MA in, uh, at Andrews and a PhD from the University of London, became a church pastor, evangelist, conference president, and then moved to Avondale College where he was principal and then he is now president of the South Pacific Division. He is married to Don and has three children. Um, it is the book it's written from a perspective that views scriptures as decisive. As the introduction puts it, its authority takes precedence over all other sources of information concerning origins. It's mostly about theology because of that. It uh, talks about evidence for the faithful transmission of the text, argument against higher criticism, and for a view consonant with Jesus and the New Testament. But it does include five scientific chapters by Tim Standish, uh, Tim Standish uh, Grenville Kent, John Walton, whom we will be talking about now, James Gibson, and Ariel Roth. Uh, it also deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary morality. Those are the last two chapters. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know, so um, <coughs> I couldn't find it on the internet. So I emailed John Walton, and this is what he sent me. Uh, John C. Walton was born at St. Albans, England, and was educated at Stanborough School at Watford Grammar School before reading chemistry at she Sheffield University. He graduated from Sheffield University in 1963 and studied for his PhD under the supervision of uh, Professor Lord Tedler at Sheffield and at St. Andrews Universities. He joined the science faculty of Dundee University in 1967 and moved to St. Andrews University in 1970, rising to full professor of chemistry in 1997. He became research professor of chemistry in 2007. He is married to Jane and has a son, Christopher, and a daughter, Emma. His research institutes are in the area of organic chemistry with a focus on free radicals, which are dear to my heart. He has published over 280 articles in learned journals as well as three books. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 1991 and was awarded the Royal Society of Chemistry Silver Medal for Organic Reaction Mechanisms in 1994. He was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 1995. He was Chairman of the Royal Society of Chemistry Electron Spin Resonance Group from 2001 to 2004. Free radicals happen to be a part of that. Uh, he has a lively interest in matters relating to science and faith. Uh, he has written a number of magazine articles on origin themes and given lectures in the UK and overseas. He is an elder of the Dundee's SDA Church. So that's John Walton. John begins his uh, uh, chapter as, the, as follows. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was launched in the second half of the 19th century into a climate of opinion very favorable to grandiose universal theories. The ground had been prepared by a succession of remarkable scientific insights that seemed to be building towards a grand, unified, deterministic theory of everything. Isaac Newton's laws of gravity had explained the motions of the planets and stars, and it led to the idea of the universe as one colossal interconnecting machine, seamlessly operating in absolute space and time. In the early 19th century, John Dalton's atomic theory of matter led to a huge advance in understanding about the stuff planets and stars were composed of. When in 1828, Frederick uh, uh, Weller or something like that, I'm not sure. Anyway, <coughs> converted inner, the inorganic compound ammonium cyanate to the organic compound urea, a serious blow was dealt to the idea that compounds derived from living sources possessed a special vital force. Instead, it appeared that biological organisms, including human beings, were made of atoms and molecules, essentially similar to those encountered in the mineral world. James Clerk Maxwell's famous equations from the 1860s unified electricity and magnetism and showed that light was another manifestation of the same pro uh, phenomenon. 
The success of science in explaining how the inanimate world functioned led naturally to the expectation that the biological world would soon yield its secrets to scientific advance. When The Origin of Species was published in 1859, Darwin's ideas resonated strongly with those anticipating that human reason, coupled with science, would provide powerful and universal laws of biology. Darwin's idea of all living things descending from a simple common ancestor by natural selection among emerging favorable traits seemed to fulfill this dream. Darwin was not able to offer a precise explanation of how species arose, new species arose, but by the 1930s and 1940s, Darwin's idea had been married to population genetics. The resultant theory, which became known as the, quote, modern synthesis, end quote, or the neo-Darwinian synthesis, is still the dominant paradigm in evolutionary biology. Even before the final coalescence of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, the climate of opinion in the physical sciences was turning away from Victorian certainties. Almost all the grand naturalistic theories began to unravel in the 20th century. Early on, scientists succeeded in splitting Dalton's atoms, revealing deeper layers of electrons and nuclei. Eventually, the inner structure of quarks and gluons were discovered within the nuclei themselves. Study of these fundamental species disclosed that they did not follow classical electromagnetic and me mechanical laws, but required new quantum mechanical principles. From about 1910 onward, the closed deterministic Newtonian view, worldview was giving way to the quantum worldview. Although the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics are still being debated, several crucial conclusions are well established. The quantum world is statistical, so there are no certainties. Then Heisenberg's uncertainty principle established that mechanical explanations of natural processes are always incomplete, and hence the universe can never be described completely. The future is open. These discoveries threw a dose of cold water over mechanical deterministic explanations of how nature originated and functioned. A watershed in the popularity of the naturalist worldview can be discerned in the 1950s and 1960s. A remarkable picture of a universe created out of nothing, at a definite start date, was beginning to emerge from physics and cosmology. The universe was being revealed as much more strange and mysterious than had been supposed by the Victorian humanists. The deciphering of the structure of DNA in 1953 was a key factor in reshaping the scientific uh, landscape. DNA was shown to consist of two long complementary chains of nucleotides linked in a specific order, twisted up into a double helix. The exact order in which the nucleotides appear is a code carrying the information cells need to build individual proteins. There's a close analogy to the way letter and word sequences carry information in a book. The implications of this arrangement for genomes, gene expression, replication, and gene damage are still being explored. During the next decades, the science of molecular biology began its rise to stardom. The fantastically complex structures of many cell components were worked out, along with their operation as tiny molecular machines. The huge challenges that the amazing organization and information content of these biological structures posed for evolutionary theory began to be appreciated. A superlative achievement of molecular biology was the elucidation of the mechanism of protein synthesis and all its intricate complexity. The discovery of how this amazing molecular level system of information storage, transcription, code translation, and protein manufacture worked was a triumph of scientific insight. It was immediately apparent, however, that the complex structures of the approximately 100 DNA, RNA, and protein biomolecules involved, their complementary matching shapes, the machine-like operation of individual components, and the orchestrated coordination of the whole system gave every appearance of design. Explaining how this could have originated in terms of random chemical process, processes was going to pose an incalculable challenge for evolutionary biologists. By the second half of the 20th century, confidence in scientific explanations as paramount descriptions of nature had diminished markedly outside of the biological sciences. 
the old deterministic Newtonian worldview had gone completely. Difficulties in marrying the classical domain of physics with the quantum mechanical domain, along with uncertainties about the interpretation and philosophical implications of the latter, had strengthened the view of all scientific theories as partial and incomplete models of nature rather than actual descriptions of reality. On the other hand, the wonderful successes of molecular biology had inspired biologists with great confidence in the power and usefulness of their scientific paradigms. The success of molecular biology and its perceived prestige had carried evolutionary biology along on its coattails. Defining evolution. There are several different schools of thought about what constitutes good science. However, well-established scientific theories almost always have certain characteristics. One, crucial aspects can be tested in well-chosen laboratory experiments. Two, they are unified and systematized uh, by a mathematical framework. And three, they are able to make quantitative estimates or at least well-defined predictions about future outcomes. How does evolutionary biology stand up in relation to these criteria? It is important first to identify what really constitutes evolution, because the term is obviously rather flexible. Sometimes evolution is loosely used for any kind of change in biology. Small-scale changes in a population over a few generations, also known as change below the species levels, is best called microevolution. And I'm omitting a little bit for uh, uh, trying to pare this down and get it in within less than an hour. Um, all of those ellipses are mine, by the way. The biological species concept, which, had, uh, which demarcates species as groups of organisms capable of interbreeding and producing fertile op offspring, is a widely held rule. There is a fine distinction to be drawn between a group of related species that are incapable of interbreeding, even artificially, and a group of organisms that do not interbreed because of geographical isolation or lack of empathy, but from which live offspring could be obtained artificially. For the latter group, permanent differentiation has not occurred and must be sought at the genus or perhaps even at the family classification level. Macroevolution refers to large-scale innovations bringing into existence new organs, new body plans, or other genuinely new biological structures. In macroevolution, novel genetic information not present in the ancestral genome appears. In its broadest sense, evolution refers to the origin of new species, genera, or families, and encompasses the development of the whole biological domain from molecules to man. This grandiose progress from microorganisms to plants to animals is what Darwin had in mind and what is usually meant in the context of origins. Evidence of microevolution, and he lists a bunch of them including finches, uh, from the Galapagos, peppered moths, changes in the limb size of Caribbean lizards, or otherwise known as tree anoles. Significantly, he says, however, fossil anoles uh, preserved in amber, supposedly 20 million years old, were, quote, virtually indistinguishable from the tree canopy habitat. In other words, the evolution that was expected didn't actually occur. And then he talks about deer mice and changes in their coats. Microevolution is not controversial and is accepted by neo-Darwinists and creationists alike. The latter believe living things were designed with the capability to adapt within limits to changing environmental and ecological circumstances. Now, the quest for evidence of macroevolution is a different story. Neo-Darwinists insist there is no essential difference between microevolution and macroevolution, and he gives a very good explanation of that. Evolution beyond the species level results in beginning and ending generations that could not interbreed, but the intermediate generations could. If the beginning and ending generations, even though classified as different species, could still be bred artificially, then the process should still be considered as microevolution. And that's why they just say macroevolution is microevolution writ large. A common procedure used by evolutionary biologists is simply to arrange a group of organisms in order, according to a progression in some physical characteristics. It is then confidently asserted that the sequence demonstrates macroevolution and that different species are related by common ancestry. 
Are there cases of macroevolution from repeatable laboratory experiments or from carefully supervised field observations carried out under controlled conditions? Although observations over geologic time are not, of course, possible, this is not too much to ask because species that multiply very rapidly and run through hundreds and even thousands of generations are available. And then he talks about the uh, mutable fruit fly. All the observed changes belong to the microevolutionary category. It's a summary of that uh, comment. He talks about a variety having four wings instead of the usual two. The intent is shock and awe at the power of evolution. The second set of wings, however, is non-functional. The insect is therefore actually disabled. The clear message from these experiments is that there are limits beyond which changes cannot go. The most frequent correlated response of one-sided selection is a drop in general fitness. This plagues virtually every experiment. Smart bacteria to the rescue. Um, Jerry Coyne claimed that experiments carried out by Paul Rainey and a co-worker with Pseudomonas fluorescens constituted one clear example of speciation. The bacterium was said to evolve through mutations and selection in a non-uniform broth to two new ecologically different species, but this wasn't the whole story. Rainey also found that when the different forms were placed back into the original environment, they, quote, suffered a rapid loss of diversity, end quote. In other words, new species were not formed in these experiments. As uh, bacteriologist Alan Linton said, none exist in the literature claiming that one species has been shown to evolve into another. Bacteria, the simplest form of independent life, are ideal for this kind of study, with generation times 20 to 30 minutes and populations achieved after 18 hours. But throughout 150 years of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another. So uh, evolutionists resort to what he calls woolly scenarios and special pleading. Hard evidence for macroevolution from repeatable laboratory experiments or controlled field studies is notably lacking. Evolutionary theory is dominated by narrative scenarios that lack rigor or are too plastic for an ambiguous testing or for use in making secure predictions. There is no mathematical framework that enables well-defined predictions to be made about future generations of evolution or what new species of uh, evolution will generate. Uh, notice back then his criteria of science and how he's saying evolution fails that. Observations about an organism's past and present are simply fitted as best may be to some imaginary preconceived scenario. In molecular biology, most advantages actually owe nothing to evolutionary biology but came about by genetic engineering. And he talks about insulin and human growth hormone and uh, put into uh, yeast. Uh, gen genetically modified mice, crops, a bacterial cell, and of course he's talking about the Venter uh, creation of a, a genome from more or less scratch. Assessing the limits of neo-Darwinian evolution. The actual conclusion emerging from quantifiable research is that there are definite limits on the biological change that can be achieved by natural selection acting in conjunction with random mutations. Experiments all showed that once mutational changes reach a certain quite limited amount of alteration, the organism simply dies or its offspring becomes sterile. Michael Behe, and he's talking about, of course, the edge of evolution. Uh, over the past decade, E. coli has been the subject of the most extensive laboratory evolution study ever conducted. And what is evolution wrought? Mostly devolution. The lesson of E. coli is that it's easier for evolution to break things than to make things. Behe suggested that malaria is the best test case for Darwin's theory. However, the outcome is very different from that expected by neo-Darwinists. The changes in the human genome in response to malaria, as well as the amendments to the parasite's genome, point to radical limits on the effectiveness of random mutation. He talks about sickle cell anemia and says, thus the SC mutant can never take over completely. However, complete takeover is necessary for evolution to advance. 
The malaria parasite has never developed a counter to the SC mutation, although it has mutated to produce resistance to a variety of anti-malarial drugs, including chloroquine and atovaquone. In each case, as soon as the drug was withdrawn from use, the resistant strains of the parasite died out. In other words, they're not as fit as the ordinary, uh, except for their resistance to drugs. Behe arrived at two important conclusions from reviewing cases of drug resistance with a range of organisms. First, beneficial mutations invariably entail harm to the gene function and weaken the organism relative to its original variety. Second, known beneficial mutations only produce trivial changes and no new biological structures are ever formed. The DNA revolution. In the 1980s, gene sequences gradually became easier sequencing gradually became easier and more widespread. Huge strides were taken during the 2000s when automated DNA sequencing instruments became available. More and more genes had been sequenced, culminating or perhaps peaking, uh, but certainly still going on, in February 2001 with publication of the complete human genome. This technique put a powerful new tool into the hands of evolutionary scientists and opened a whole new window on the study of biological relationships. Junk DNA from rubbish to essential resource. And those of you who are here last week may remember we discussed this. Uh, it's come out even more than when he wrote the book. Um, evolutionary biologists made the prediction that the genomes of modern organisms would be full of fossil DNA left over from previous ancestors, but no longer useful. Coyne predicted, we expect to find in the genome of many species silenced or dead genes. Genes that once were useful but are no longer intact or expressed. In other words, there should be vestigial genes. In contrast, the idea that all species were created from scratch predicts that no such genes would exist since there would be no common ancestors in which those genes were active. Uh, that's not quite true, as uh, Bob Miloshenko will tell you. There are reasons to suspect that, uh, that uh, we might see uh, degeneration and perhaps even uh, deliberate degeneration. But, um, but it's certainly a, a first pass reasonable uh, estimate. At first it seemed that the evolutionary scenario would be confirmed. Geneticists discovered huge amounts of DNA that didn't seem to be used in building proteins. The term junk DNA came into popular use. At one time, 98% of the human genome was said to be junk, junk. But events have overtaken and thoroughly overturned this view. Evidence pouring in from the genome sequencing projects show that virtually all of an organism's DNA is transcribed into RNA, and that even though most of that RNA is not transcribed into proteins, it performs other essential regu regulatory functions. One big surprise was a comparatively, comparatively small size of the human genome, only about 30,000 genes. Some plants and trees, supposedly much earlier in the evolutionary chain, have over 40,000. And we're going downhill. It was evident that genes alone could not account for the structural and metabolic complexity of organisms. And then he quotes Princeton's Professor David Stern. Research has shown that instructional regions outside the protein Coding regions are important for regulating when genes are turned on and off. Now we're finding that additional copies of these genetic instructions are important for maintaining stable gene functions in a variety, in a variable environment, so that genes produced the right or output for organisms to develop normally. In fruit flies, um, he talks about, and then he talks about another report, a retrotransposon found in at least eight different places in the mouse genome. Obese mice that did not possess this retrotransposon had higher blood glucose, more fat in their livers, and were more prone to diabetes. And he quotes uh, Frank Slack. These RNAs direct such diverse processes as gene silencing, transcriptional and translational control, imprinting, and dosage compensation. These discoveries have electrified the biological community as we try to understand the extent of the RNA world and how regulatory RNAs work in controlling gene expression. We are fast learning that vast portions of the genome that do not code for protein, protein are in fact transcribed and that these regions, previously thought to be junk, may be useful after all. And skipping a 
paragraph. Um, Uprooting Darwin's tree of life, Charles Darwin believed that the evolutionary ascent of all species through time could be represented by what he termed the tree of life, in modern parlance, the phylogenetic tree. <laughs> this tree stemmed from un some universal common ancestor and grew through a trunk dividing into branches, representing individual species. And I think I left out a, a, uh, an ellipsis there at the end. Uh, as DNA sequencing techniques became available, an exciting prospect opened of confirming the traditional anatomical phylogenetic tree by comparison with an independently created molecular tree. The earliest sequencing experiments in the 1970s and 1980s involved RNA found in ribosomes. The results boded well for evolution. By the mid-1980s, there was great optimism that molecular techniques would reveal the definitive universal tree of life triumphantly unifying the anatomical and molecular areas of evolutionary biology. And he goes on to say that there's uh, uh, evolutionists made a big deal of all this. However, troubling data began, uh, began to appear, that's my typo, in the early 1990s when it became possible to sequence actual DNA from a wide range of organisms. Sometimes these DNA sequences matched the RNA tree, but crucially, sometimes a different tree emerged. As more and more genes were sequenced, a plethora of different trees began to surface. Some evolutionary biologists began talking about a forest of trees, while others proposed nets or webs of relationships. Uh, Doolittle is quoted saying, the, the history of life cannot be properly be represented by a tree. If there is a tree of life, it's a small anomalous structure growing out of the web of life, said John Dupre. And then he quotes Lawton as saying, Sivanen recently compared 2,000 genes that are common to humans, frogs, sea squirts, sea urchins, fruit flies, and nematodes. It's a lot of genes. In theory, he should have been able to use the gene sequences to construct an evolutionary tree showing the relationships between the six animals. He failed. The problem was that different genes told contradictory evolutionary stories. This was especially true of sea squirt genes. Michael Rose said, the tree of life is being politely buried. We all know that. What's less accepted is that our whole fundamental view of biology needs to change. Michael Sivanen, who was quoted a little earlier, we've just annihilated the tree of life. It's not a tree anymore. It's a different topology entirely. By carefully selecting the data to include and exclude, it is, of course, still possible to construct impressive seeming phylogenetic trees. However, it is clear that this central tenet of neo-Darwinism has lost much of its impact. Sadly, this fact did not induce many professional biologists to question the validity of neo-Darwinism itself. Rather, the complex networks molecular biology revealed began to be interpreted in terms of a process called horizontal gene transfer. Keep in mind that directed horizontal gene transfer is, of course, genetic engineering. Geneticists now believe HGT to be extremely common in all types of organisms. Of course, this is highly speculative. A uh, comparison of human and ape chromosomes. The genomic DNA of many species is tightly wound up in a set of complex packages called chromosomes. Humans possess 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. Chromosome number two, the second largest, with more than 237, and I think he meant to say 237 million, but uh, um, <coughs> nucleotide pairs. Evidence came to light in the 1980s and 1990s that chromosome 2 might have arisen from the fusion of two original chromosomes. The ends of all chromosomes are marked with telomeres. It was shown that the central region of human chromosome 2 contained a characteristic repeating telomeric sequence with the side sequences right next to it. All chromosomes have characteristic DNA called aploid, aploid sequences um, in centromeres. Evidence was found of more than one such centromere in chromosome two, lending credence to the idea that it resulted from a fusion of two original chromosomes. 
This probable alteration in the number of human chromosomes is neither unprecedented nor troubling. And uh, that sounds like a throwaway statement, except that, listen to the next paragraph. Other examples of variations in chromosomal numbers within individual species is known. For example, the male Indian muntjac deer possesses seven chromosomes and the female six. Apparently the X chromosome is fused to another chromosome. Um, <clears throat> whereas the Chinese muntjac has 23 pairs of chromosomes in both sexes. The surprising thing is they look identical and can interbreed. The evidence is that chromosomal number reduction within certain lineages can, be, can readily be tolerated and amounts to a form of microevolution. Chimpanzees, gorillas, orangut and orangutans possess 48 chromosomes. Evolutionary biologists have made comparisons between human chromosome 2 and ape chromosomes 2p and 2q and claim that there is a good match, particularly of the telomere and centromere regions. They conclude that human chromosome 2 came from the fusion of two ancestral ape chromosomes. Kenneth Miller and Dennis Alexander promote their accounts of this as compelling evidence of human descent from apes. We have the same number of chromosomes except for that one fusion. It is very significant, however, that a fusion of chromosomes 2p and 2q is not found in any set of ape chromosomes. So no, nobody else has done it. The fusion event does not connect the human genome with any ape genome. What of the supposed match between the two ape chromosomes and human chromosome 2? The original evidence of this was that high resolution banding pattern of human chromosome 2 aligned well with the banding pattern of ape chromosomes 2p and 2q. It was also found that human chromosome 2 specific DNA hybridized with ch chimpanzee chromosomes uh, 2p and 2q. Of course, there are comparatively, these are comparatively coarse grain techniques. Evidence soon began to accumulate that the picture was much more complicated than implied by Miller and Alexander. It was reported that secondary aphloid DNA was present not just in human chromosome 2, but also in human chromosome 9. Subsequent hybridization studies with 21 different human aphloid DNA probes and the full range of a grade 8 chromosomes revealed that the majority of the human probes did not hybridize to their corresponding equivalent ape chromosomes, but to non-corresponding chromosomes. Thus, the significance of hybridization results was called into question. Many genes close to the proposed fusion sites were also found strewn around on other chromosomes. With the advent of automatic sequencing techniques, it became possible to make direct comparison of the nucleotide sequences in regions of human and ape chromosomes. A recent review of the results concluded, the plethora of genetic changes that differentiate humans from their closest relatives, the chimpanzees, affect multiple levels and are much more complex than was assumed prior to the advent of genome-wide comparative analyses. Further, the identification of the individual components of the structural divergence between human and chimpanzee genomes has been accompanied by the di discovery of very considerable lineage-specific structural diversity. They don't look like each other. Anatomical homology, to be or not to be descendants. Anatomical and physiological similarities are observed across many species. Neo-Darwinism predict, therefore, that homologous structures would have been built via homologous genes. Makes sense. Modern DNA se sequencing has shown this prediction to be wrong. For instance, the homologous body segments of fruit flies and wasps were found to arise from entirely different developmental pathways. Neo-Darwinism also predicted that non-homologous structures should result from non-homologous genes. The structure and wiring of the eyes of the squid, fruit fly, and mouse, and human, which is like the mouse, are very different. Yet the same gene is involved in the development of all three. And you could kind of buy the squid human stuff, but the fruit fly? 
fossils in common descent. The limited space available for this short chapter does not permit a critique of geochronology. Earth's Catastrophic Past by Andrew Snelling and Origin by Design by Harold Coffin, Robert Brown, and L. James Gibson are referred to, and also the survey provided in Chapter 15, which we will get a, uh, a review of next week. Uh, features of the fossil record appearing to support neo-Darwinism. The fossil succession, number one, the fossil succession shows a pattern of appearances as expected if new species were evolving and displacing less competitive forms. And he mentions trilobite fossils, glossopteridales, ichthyosaur fossils, and dinosaur fossils. The two, the fossil record seems to show an uneven trend from simple species in the earliest strata to complex in the most recent strata although trilobites seem to be pretty complex. Three, neo-Darwinists also claim that predicted intermediate or transitional forms between branches of the evolutionary tree have been found for a large number of transitions. The migration of eyes to one side of the flat fish head is an example, the transition from fish to amphibian, uh, take a look, a series of mammal-like reptiles, and then ar archaeopteryx and whales are the examples given. Features of the fossil record opposed to neo-Darwinism. Uh, number one, sudden emergence of new life forms. The Cambrian explosion, but also the mammalian radiation, the angiosperm big bloom, um, and there are others that he didn't mention. Uh, George Gaylord Simpson wrote, it is a feature of the known fossil record that most taxa appear abruptly. They are not, as a rule, led up to by a sequence of almost imperceptibly changing forerunners such as Darwin believed should be usual in evolution. This phenomenon becomes more universal and more intense as the hierarchy of categories is ascended. Which is, of course, the precise reverse. The farther apart two species are, the more intermediates there should be, and therefore the more likely you are to capture them. Two, stasis. Fossils res remain essentially anatomically unchanged through the whole time they appear in the record. Crane flies, herring, sea urchins, ferns, chambered nautilus, comb jelly, all the modern ones look just like the, the old ones. Uh, lack of transitional fossils. Far too few transitional fossils have been discovered. We just read that quote by uh, Simpson. Humans differ from the great apes. Many leading paleontologists consider that Homo habilis fossil material, which is the one thing that might make a halfway decent transition, actually represents at least two, if not three, different species that mistakenly have been amalgamated. And you all know what happens when amalgamation happens. Uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, Ernst Meyer wrote in 2002, Given the fact of evolution, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual steady change from ancestral form to des descendants. But this is not what the paleontologist finds. This is, by the way, written in 2002. The discovery of unbroken series of species changing gradually into descending species is very rare. Indeed, the fossil record is one of discontinuities, seemingly documenting jumps or saltations from one kind of organism to a different type. Unconvincing transitional fossils. And he talks about microevolution, which, of course, the eye migration in flatfish he feels is an example of, and I think he's right. And then he talks about Tikalik, which is scarcely different from those of uh, the fins, or scarcely different from those of some other fish. Furthermore, Tikalik's rear fins remain unmistakable fins. And of course, uh, tetrapods have four of them. The mammal-like reptile fossils, these were found in geographically widely separated areas, and the yellow is my words. Uh, there are different sized skulls that have been made the same size in order to make it look better, which, by the way, also happens in the whale um, lineage. The fossil-based uh, family of tree 
of placental mammals, and that's my misspelling, is very different from the one derived from the DNA comparisons. Anachronistic fossils. Dawkins and Coyne wrote, not a single authentic fossil has ever been found in the wrong place in the evolutionary sequence. Such an, an anachronistic fossil, if one were ever unearthed, would blow evolution out of the water. As the great biologist J.B.S. Haldane growled when asked what might disprove evolution, fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. However, in practice, the evolutionary establishment has an arsenal of brutally effective methods for dealing with anachronistic finds. To begin with, uh, geochronology is far from an exact science, and he pulls out the case of K and M ER 1470, the Skull 1470, and Robert uh, Roger Lewin uh, does a great job on that, and he doesn't mention that uh, Lubinow uh, makes it even more ridiculous what happened. Grossly out of place fossils, evolutionary paleontologists are certain such fossils are impossible, and therefore they always classify them as intrusive, or they are labeled frauds. Enough doubt can always be sown to discredit findings that contradict the evolutionary consensus. And he notes uh, Cremo and Thompson in Forbidden Archaeology. Evaluating the fossil evidence. Only naive and uncritical individuals can agree with Alexander. Every twig and branch of the great bush of life can be traced back in time to the trunk and the roots from which the whole bush originates. The balance of the fossil evidence tips decidedly against support for neo-Darwinian common descent. Popular accounts, he talks about Ida, which some of you are familiar with. Uh, the barrage of hype is telling evidence of neo-Darwinism's desperate need to convince of convincing transitional forms. You see, if the situation were really as described by Alexander and Coyne, a new intermediate fossil would be routine and of interest only to a modest circle of specialists. This is the new thing, it did the job. That's because the old things really didn't do the job and they know it. Finally, he talks about, this is the closing uh, section, Downsizing Neo-Darwinism, he says, the scientific evidence reviewed in this chapter demonstrates that Neo-Darwinian evolution is an overblown concept in urgent need of downsizing. And I'm going to skip the next two paragraphs and go to the last one. It is clear that the fossil record and genetic studies are in agreement with the traditional Christian understanding of kinds designed and made with the ability to, to adapt to changing geographical and ecological conditions. It is high time that Neo-Darwinian evolution joined all the other grandiose universal 19th century systems in being drastically scaled down. Evolution's pretensions to be a grand universal paradigm encompassing vast regions of biological science have not stood up. Evolution in any guise ought now to be recognized for what it is, a limited theory that may help to explain minor changes and adaptations. Certainly, microevolution cannot explain the origin of life or the origin of species, and its influence in theology and philosophy ought to be negligible. Now, I like John Walton's approach. Um, it fits well into the book's theme, the defense of the scriptural st story of Genesis, which starts out with the, the uh, chapters on theology that we talked about. And then the next chapter is on intelligent design, cosmology, and then his, his chapter on the limits of evolution. And uh, then we're going to come to critiques of evolutionary theory from uh, evolutionists, which is uh, Jim's Gibson. But next week we'll be talking about the flood and also a little bit about time. Um, and. Uh, then there's a chapter on evolutionary ethics and theistic evolution. Now, Dr. Walton, I think, gives a rapid but fairly comprehensive critique of neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. Uh, frankly, I had a great deal of difficulty shortening the chapter to uh, uh, what I have done. Um, there are a few pieces that might be added, such as fossil pollen in the Precambrian in Venezuela that would 
I think also further substantiate his point about how evolutionists deal with contrary data. Um, I, there's only one major typo. And um, I, I think all in all that it's a very good chapter. But um, now it is your turn to comment. Thank you. I, I just want to pass this one back to whoever wants it. Want to give praise to our great God, who uh, foils the, all the other false gods. And I was just thinking as I was I was reading some of this chapter this morning that he is. He's the one that allows inventions. He allows discoveries. That's my uh, understanding. And he is allowing all these wonderful discoveries in, you know, microbiology uh, to help to try to help these people, convince them of his existence. And so he's great and he's loving. I have to say amen. We have a comment back here. Um, I would just like to add that God is not only allowing, he's hoping that we will take amen. every opportunity to discover and to learn. And sadly, what we see here is the typical, uh, how should I say, contrast between and the attitude of light and that of the other. In one case, there is a, a searching for everything that could possibly be found. In the other, it's a straight dogmatic denial simply because that cannot be the way it is, and that's all there is to it. Perhaps that, in a nutshell, describes to us the, the nature of the battle between good and evil, ultimately. Um, I have kind of uh, one minor observation to, to attach to that, and that is, how much further would we have been if intelligent design had been the major paradigm in terms of the ENCODE data that we have now? Um, could we have done it 10, 15 years before? by looking at uh, junk DNA and, and uh, looking for function instead of assuming that it was junk. Just a thought. Um. Since the microphone is nearby, I'll make a comment. Um, I think we need to also look at the fossil record, which we'll do in the future here more. There are maybe four or five different major gulfs, I call them a gulf or canyon, where uh, evolutionary theory finds it impossible to jump across that gulf or chasm. Of course, the first uh, gulf is going from non-life to life. That first living cell, you almost have to have a scenario where you get derive that cell from somewhere else, outer space, or some kind of unusual circumstance. The next big gulf is to go from simple cells to very complex organisms. And um, that's at the uh, Cambrian, largely at the Cambrian. There's some somewhat complex life b below the Cambrian. But when you look at the fossil record and see what happens at the base of the Cambrian is just its major explosion. And evolutionary theory is looking for the transitions that gradually lead up to it. They haven't found it yet. The next uh, goal for chasm would be to go from sea life to land life. And there's a lot of speculation how the uh, fins of fish can turn into limbs of land creatures, but uh, 
almost every scenario falls flat. And there's a lot of stuff on the web, by the way. I would encourage everyone to look at that transition. All the scenarios they've come up with can be heavily critiqued, and they are critiqued on the web. The next one is an area I'm interested in, and that's uh, the first uh, flowering plants. And as you know, flowering plants provide the basis for our food supply, and especially humans and mammals. Um, we, need, we need that fruit and that source of food. And be, below the Cretaceous, I have just studying that in the last few weeks, below Cretaceous, there is not a shred of valid evidence that you have flowering plants. And uh, I know that's debatable a little bit in some circles, but I'm writing a paper on that. And then the final big gulf, of course, is to go from the hominids to humans and to explain uh, power of thought, the appreciation of beauty, the uh, aesthetic sense, the moral sense, socialization, the higher socialization, problem solving, all of this. There's a huge gap between the highest uh, chimpanzee, living ape, and us. Huge gap. So that's where we're at. But that reinforces what everything he said today. Comment here and then we're back there. It's going to get worse. I don't think we've come to the peak yet of the antitypical day of Noah approach. I mean, in Noah's day, people could see the Garden of Eden. They, they understood more of what was going on, and yet they were even harder in their hearts about the truth. I mean, they chose to believe a lie. When you see Noah preaching for 120 years, everyone who came at first believed but because of shame and force of other people's opinions and just the desire to believe the lie that will never die. I mean, they were able to devise theories and reasonings. And it's interesting is when all the animals came and went into the ark, people's hearts started to almost cease with them. I mean, it was just too... And they asked their wise men what's happened. They were able to deduce theories. Of course, I'm sure they were all junk, but if you want to believe it, I mean, you have that choice. So we're at a point now where everyone has a choice, but what you basically believe, you know, without a lot of work from the Holy Spirit is just going to continue. Well, in this connection, uh, um, I think it was Richard Feynman, it was, um, uh, who said that uh, you have to be very careful not to fool yourself. That's the number one rule in science. And he said, you are the easiest person to fool. <coughs> Well, there's other areas, too, where there, uh, evolutionists are having a um, major problem. And here's one of them, um, a guy by the name of Shapiro from Chicago, which I, uh, he's uh, been writing for 40-some years. Is that he's, Robert or James, or do you know? I, I believe it's Robert. OK. Um, and um, anyway, he wrote a he, great book in 1986, yes, by the way. Yeah, that's the one. And he wrote an article, um, which uh, is probably less than two years old, and I believe it was in Science, or it could have been Proceedings of National Academy. And I, anyway, that's immaterial at this point. And he was writing about bacteria, and he was saying how bacteria, are, we look upon them as being um, nothing but single cell, um, and these are my words, sort of idiots going around just trying to multiply. And he wrote a very uh, convincing article and breathtaking in its scope about how that they are really superorganisms. They work very intricately together, how they ap approach prey and how they encircle it. They work together. It's um, it, all kinds of quote unquote intelligence is shown throughout the way the masses of bacteria work together. And he points out that prokaryotes 
And by the way, a big gulf is between prokaryote and eukaryote. There's as big a gulf there almost as anywhere in that chain. Except for life. Except for life. Um, and he points out that prokaryotes um, have a uh, ability, the, uh, it's highly conserved in prokaryotes, and it's one of the th few things that is conserved over to eukaryotes, although the enzymes involved are different. But its ability to, um, um, with great accuracy, replicate its genome in uh, these prokaryotes that have to replicate the entire uh, cell in, um, in an organism in 20 minutes, that they will, it will take, they put down 4,000, um, up to 4,000 nucleotides in just seconds is the rate that they're going in the, in the uh, three major enzymes which catalyze this whole process, that they're uncannily accurate. It's nine, nine point, with nine nines after it, percent accurate. And that the cells are working so, uh, that evolution has worked so hard to keep the status quo. Now stop and think about that for a moment. You've got selection to keep the organism exactly as it is, but we're arguing that it was differences that brought you there. <laughs> so you now have evolution working against evolution. And a house now, divided against itself cannot stand. That, that's 99.999, which means that they make a mistake once in every billion times. More than, it's a billion plus. And at 4,000 nucleotides per second. Do you realize how, I mean, stop and think about that for a moment. The speed and the accuracy, and he was showing what speed and accuracy, you know, don't think of these as just single cell blobs of cytoplasm, which very fundamental rudimentary life forces are working in it. These are extremely well engineered and unbelievable machines. And, um, but the, the, the whole thing there, which he doesn't even point out is, he lauds evolution for coming up with this almost mistake-free uh, ability to replicate, which our, our machines that we make are, can't even begin, we're not even in the same uh, universe with that. That's completely uh, way out there. I'm and sure we throw more than one billion, or uh, one in a billion uh, computer chips that we make away yes. because they're defective. And so how great for natural selection to come up with this uh, foolproof way to keep the organism just the way it is, when in actuality <laughs> evolution should have been working to get the, evolu the uh, organisms to change randomly continually to come up with the best possible new organism to fit the environment. Uh, before we go on, I will point out it is now 11.30 and I know that some of you have uh, other appointments you need to keep. but. Uh, for those of you who want to stay for a little bit, uh, we'll uh, keep the discussion open. Just to note that, that this wonderful apparatus that does this wonderful uh, replication and repair is only operational because it is inside of a well-regulated, contained environment bordered by a membrane. You poke holes in that membrane, all the elaborate systems grind to a halt, and you basically have a dead cell. And no amount of praising the system will bring it back to life. This is the fascinating thing. While we are looking at ways to generate the uh, molecular assemblies that can reproduce themselves, as it were, we forget that on their own, they couldn't possibly carry on their function unless they were part of an entire package. Without that entire package, none of the pieces really does anything. I'm just going to add to that. If you take the human genome and you want to start uh, replication or translation at any certain part of that genome, m a myriad of, in the thousands of different chemical reactions have to occur to expose that part of the DNA. But then you need at least 51 essential 
protein catalysts to be a, a, a present in the right concentration and in the right sequence. In other words, you have to have the, them come in, this is on, on the microseconds, in the right order and time frame, enter in to form the translational um, complex, as it's called, which then attaches to the promoter region and begins the translation. If, if you don't, some of them will have five or ten parts. Yes. And if you don't have all 51 of the intact catalytic proteins that are fitting together, and they have to come in in the right order to form the proper uh, uh, translation complex, there's no translation. And that only about one in a thousand of these complexes actually goes through and is able, uh, 999 fail, and every thousandth comes in and is successful because it is so um, entirely, it, it's so precise and everything has to be exactly correct, which is an excellent way for the cell to keep its translation to only that which is absolutely required for the cell. It is a way to save energy and resources. Just uh, absolutely amazing engineering. And uh, to think that that all happened by somebody just randomly arranging stuff makes, uh, okay. makes really no sense at all. I think in a way John Walton had one of the easier assignments um, because there is so much evidence that uh, makes it really hard to believe in unguided evolution. Uh, guided's a whole different story, uh, and we'll come to that uh, later on. But, uh, but the, the idea that you can just do this by um, shaking atoms together and seeing what happens is, just makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, perhaps Ariel Roth could help us with this. I've been reading um, the 54-page compilation that is available from the Geoscience Research Institute of everything Mrs. White says about geology and science, which was made, I don't know, 15 years ago for, um, I guess, the General Conference for the, for the so summer science uh, field trips. Is that still available from the... Geoscience Research Institute, Mrs. White's writings on geology and science? Well, I don't know. I've got several copies of it myself, but uh, whether they're still provided or not, I, I'm sorry I can't help you on that but right now, but uh, uh, it's certainly, um, I think it was passed on to White Estate, and they, they've, uh, it certainly must be available there. Okay. Uh, Last night, them. it appeared by magic by divine intervention on my computer. I had no idea that I had it or where it is, what the file path is, <laughs> what the <laughs> how I will find it again. So I printed it out just in case I can't find it again. We used to distribute it to every one of our field conferences and every one of the field guide books. So it's, it's, it's easily available through those if you go, but they're, they're not current right now. So I, I'd try the White Estate. Okay. The one thing that has stuck with me out of the first 20 pages, which I read last night and, and this morning, is that there is such mystery in creation and about God and in his word. And we need a lot of humility to realize we're not going to figure it all out if we study for eternity. And that's fine fine with me. It's wonderful to understand what we can, and there's plenty of evidence to, to rest our faith on, but uh, she makes so plain that if we don't have God's word as the ultimate proof of truth, then we will come to false conclusions because we're unhappy with not knowing how it happened, and so we come up with weird, crazy, false theories uh, like evolution. There may actually be um, some empirical evidence behind that statement. Um, as I understand it, one of the people who's given the Adventist Church uh, 
uh, probably more major headaches than anybody else in this area. Uh, one of the things that made him uh, gave him fits was that he couldn't figure out how it all fit together, and so <coughs> he figured that there that naturalism was a better way. Uh, so, yeah, you may be right. Uh, not just in theory, but in practice. Uh, the comment uh, here. Just, just a minute. With it. What's that? I thought you said in the beginning there was some, they wanted a movement, they didn't want the children to be able to talk creation. Well, I don't know that it's a movement. It's a video by a guy by the name of Bill Nye, who most of you may have heard of as the science guy. And um, he made the comment in, in an interview with somebody else who actually put it up on, the, on, the, uh, 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 on YouTube. And then, of course, enough people got interested in it probably from both ends of the spectrum. And the thing went viral. And I think there's uh, over a million hits at this point uh, on, the, on the video. So that's, uh, I don't know that we can or not, but I'm gonna see if I can make a reply to it. But we'll see. Well, thought control is always part of many movements, you know. That um, that is true. And that many, true. and most atheistic movements were very strong in thought control, allowed no deviation whatsoever. So I wouldn't be surprised. Well, uh, of course, you know, some of the stuff that he says on that is kind of ridiculous. Like, for example, um, that we need all to be evolutionists because we need more engineers and. Uh, uh, I think he mentioned physicians as well, but I know he mentioned engineers, and I'm going to myself, you have to believe in uh, evolution before you can build a bridge? Uh, what gives here? <laughs> it, it's a, a little bit on the, um, shall we say, kind of stretching its side. And I know that in medicine it's stretching it. Because I know probably as much about basic <laughs> science and the way it was taught, at least uh, when I took it, as anybody around. And uh, you don't need evolution to, to, to understand basic science, let alone to understand clinical medicine itself. Uh, there's a train of thought out there that uh, engenders this type of comment, of course. And that is that uh, religion is uh, faith and... Uh, in contrast to science that is objective. And uh, if you adopt a religious view, you're out there in the uh, less objective area. I would uh, submit uh, as a idea we ought to think about, and that is that it takes more blind faith to believe in evolution than in creation, that really the, the faith position is the evolution position and the scientific position is, is more the creation position. Uh, but uh, these are ill-defined Ill -defined terms, but uh, nevertheless, that prevails out there. You know, If you want to be a physician or an engineer, you have to be objective. And if you believe in creation, you're not objective. Well, what we saw this morning you know, tells you just the opposite. Uh, you really have to exhibit a tremendous amount of blind faith to believe in evolution. Well, now, there may be some Christians for which that uh, way of stating things might be true. I'm not <coughs> sure it's true of traditional Adventism, certainly. Uh, we've been pretty big on, uh, you know, fi having objective evidence. Oh, very much so. You know, th there is a very rational approach to religion, and, and uh, uh, the Bible takes a rational approach. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And uh, we're in gender to test all things and so on. Now, but and this, and this is have gone so far as to sponsor a university uh, uh, that teaches medicine. Yeah. No, this is a, a concept out there that has no, I don't think, any 
I should, it has some validity that there are, uh, you know, uh, movements and so on that uh, exhibit uh, religious movements and so on that, that aren't very objective. Yeah. Uh, but in general, uh, that statement, that belief that uh, religion is, uh, you know, without any basis, while science is solid. Uh, I think some uh, of that also okay. came from the, the Andrew Dixon White and uh, John Draper. Oh, sure, it sure. Is, it, it, it started, where, started where, then. Uh, uh, really, you know, mm. uh, true Christians believe in a flat earth, which is... Draper and so on. They, no, they established that at that time. I think that, that was a major uh, step in this uh, controversy, which, you know, it was somewhat insidious, but uh, that changed the whole uh, view of, of reality, at, at least to, to the scientific community. And they felt they were, they were, you know, the objective persons. And religion was, you know, inferior. Science is superior to religion as a, mean, a way of finding truth and so on. Well, uh, religion is not uh, purely subjective at all, or at least certainly not Adventism. Uh, Adventism is strongly empirical and uh, uh, rational and so on, which probably distinguishes us a little bit from some other religions. Uh, there's some basis for that, but uh, not in general. But it bolsters their viewpoint and strengthens their view that materialism is the answer to, to everything. Uh, but materialism, you know, is, uh, it doesn't work very well uh, when you're trying to figure out where everything came from. Uh, yeah, does that kind of answer the question a little bit? Just a minute, you've got your mic behind you. Human beings don't need objective evidence to want to, want to have thought control. And you see uh, the fact that any other thing other than Darwinian evolution is allowed to be taught essentially in schools, in many schools or universities, means that that is already a form of thought control. And it, you know, I'm, I'm just, when you look about history and look about human beings trying to control other thoughts and no deviation from that thought, it's scary. You know, the thing that I find is fascinating is that Bill and I apparently doesn't believe that evolution can be taught effectively enough in school to counteract the parents' uh, <laughs> viewpoints, which says to me something about the actual power of evolutionary theory. It's, it's a... <laughs> you, you not only need to have a voice, but you need to shut down all other voices because... It, 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 it is the best evidence. You know, you don't support something that is stable and strong. You tend to put all kinds of supports for something that is unstable and that can't really stand on its own. That, that's the reason why you put all these supports. Hey, uh -huh. It's just fascinating that in physics, nobody bothers to do that with, say, uh, a quantum, a quantum uh, theory or, 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 or Einsteinian yes. relativity. They yeah. just, you know, they, oh, you Whoa. got a better idea? Show us your data. Go for it. Yeah. If it stands, it stands. Why is it, uh, and this is the, the thing that, that, that I find uh, a, a real interesting comparison between what is happening today from, bio, from many biologists who somehow deem themselves as the authorities on what uh, ought to qualify as science. That brings us also to the issue of Ben Carson's, how should I say, <laughs> inquisition by the biologists. Um, uh, in communism, in communism, every group of whatever kind of specialists you were, regardless what you were, agricultural, musicians, 
uh, whatever, cabinet makers, if you were functioning as a group, you always had to have one who was the political leader among you. This man who speaks was, from experience. Whose, whose major concern was to make sure that uh, the group stayed faithful, right? Well, it would seem that biologists have donned uh, the cape or the, 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 the monk's mantle to maintain evolutionary orthodoxy in science no matter what and no matter by whom. So whatever your specialty is and however much accomplished you are, all of that is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is whether or not you have the imprimatur of the local evolutionary biologist. Yeah, I might add to that, uh, uh, Dobjonsky, you know, famous geneticist, uh, his famous statement that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, the same, you know, dominant idea uh, prevails per se. I, uh, a group of us from here went up to Sacramento once uh, to uh, discuss in front of the State Board of Education because they wanted to include creation in the... In the this is California State Board. California State Board of Education, uh, Dr. John Ford, who was chairman of the... who was an Adventist uh, physician, graduate of Loma Linda University, uh, was uh, helping put in it in, you know, and so we went there to help. And, uh, uh, I uh, made the statement to, to the board, what are these evolutionists afraid of? Uh, why don't they allow both IDs to be tested and studied by the students? And uh, that statement incidentally got on to uh, CBS or ABC or NBC News, I don't know, but I, I was famous that night because I was on the national news right across the country. Uh, that's the crux of the issue as far as I can see it is, what are they afraid of? Why don't they allow other views to be considered? Well, uh, next week, uh, Ariel Roth will be talking on the flood and a little bit on the time issues. Yeah, yeah, we will. We'll and uh, he's going <coughs> to, He's going to spice up the book a little, as I understand it. Right, uh, because uh, last time I talked to you about this, uh, already once in another chapter, I wrote another book, so we're going to make it a little different. And uh, so y'all come back.